God bless you, friends, and welcome to this time with us here at the Deliverance Jesus is Coming Church. We're excited about the things that we discover in God's holy word. It reveals to us his great love for us. There's one portion of scripture that's real special. In the book of Hebrews, the 10th chapter, the scriptures read to us starting around the 35th verse, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward, for you have need of patience, after that you have done the will of God, that you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and shall not tarry. We believe God's word has a life-changing power, the Holy Spirit of God that can touch and transform your life. Listen carefully as we share some of his truths with you right now. what God does for us every day. I, I, many of you probably had quite a wonderful Thursday afternoon when the snow came in. And, uh, and all of my running was maybe 15 minutes from the house and 15, 15 to 20 minutes from the house and 15 to 20 minutes back. But as I sat in traffic and looked at how people behaved, it was just so overwhelming. The attitudes of people, the behavior of people on the road, sitting in the snow. And there were people, that, there were situations that you just couldn't do anything about them. But the anger and the rage that rose up in people around was just overwhelming. I sat and uh, uh, going out to take care of, of the last thing. I said, it shouldn't take me more than 20 minutes. I'll be back home before it really gets bad. And it had been advertised in the news that the trucks were salted and the shovels and whatever were prepared to get on the roads and take care of anything. And then they later, after it was all over, said, well, we didn't expect it to be as bad as it was. Now, what did, what did you fill the trucks with the salt and then decide not to put it out? And why did you get the trucks, you know, chained up with the shovels and then didn't use them? And everywhere that I went, that was the major thing that I noticed was the problem. There was no salt, I don't know about you, but all the roads that I rode on and drove on, there was no salt, no preparation. Oh, help me Lord, thank you Jesus. And there was no shoveling and clearing, nothing to clear the roads to get folks prepared for what they had to go through. And then when I got to one street, I would call Bishop every half hour, 40 minutes to say, I just want to let you know I'm all right. I'm still out here. And he'd tell me, be careful. I, okay, I, I can't even turn around. Hear me, y'all. Can't turn around. I can't come back. I got to keep going toward my destination, toward my goal. I said, but it's going to take a little while to get here. I got to one corner, and, and when the light changed, I crossed over the street and then sat there another 45 minutes on the other side from the corner that I was on. And when I got to my destination and got into the store, there were a few workers in there and workers said, we're not going out there. We'd rather stay at work rather than get out there and fight in that traffic. And then on my return home, I knew where I had to go. And it was, it was better traveling back. I'm telling all of this for a reason. It was better traveling back than it was going. 
And as I came back, I, I, I could see the street that I had to make my turn on. But that street has a little bridge and what would happen was, as the traffic would turn to go over the bridge, if the light turned red, everything that was on the bridge got stuck. And so many of them would have to back right back out into the main road and find another route. But there were people that were just going through moments of impatience and anger over what they really had no control over. And then they wanted to blame others for what they were experiencing. Well, the officials should have done this, and the so-and-so should have done that, and this should never happen again. But see, first of all, they told us, if you can, don't go out there and it anyhow. Well, let's get into the Word of God. Let's go from there right into the Word of God. And you all can remember my last message. What did we deal with this? Anybody remember what the topic was? Let me help you. Posture. Posture. We talked about posture. And the ushers have some handouts. Please give those handouts to those who would like to have them for further study. Amen. We're going to, we're going to get into this posture. When we talked about posture, we talked about attitudes. Posture, dealing with how you position yourself in your thinking, in your behavior, what is acceptable and unacceptable. So we started out our first segment of this, talking about positive attitudes toward God. Amen, do y'all remember that? Some of y'all remember that? I, I was nice enough because some folks asked for uh, a list of those uh, attributes and those descriptions of positive attitudes toward God. I put them in this handout that I've given you. And then I'm giving you the second portion, which is what we're going to be dealing with today. The second portion, posture. We're dealing with today the negative attitudes toward God. Things that do not please God. We understand that the scripture identifies a range of negative behaviors or attitudes toward God, which believers are encouraged to Everybody say this word, avoid. 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 The holy, precious people of God, hallelujah, sometimes have these things hanging on them, but they are the things that we should avoid. The first one that you'll see in that handout for part two today is rejection. Everybody say rejection. Hmm. What does that have to do with the saints of God? Do we reject stuff? Rejection is the dismissing or refusing of a proposal or an idea. In other words, I might have something or over the past 42 plus years, we have been preaching the gospel, the word of God, the good news to you and to many of us who are still here. And some there are some folks over on this side that need copies. Please see if they get them over here on my left. Uh, and they heard the word of God. <clears throat> and we sometimes take the practice or uh, behavior of dissecting it and keeping the part that we want and throwing away other parts that we need, but because it doesn't fit my lifestyle or, or things that I enjoy, I throw them away. That's a rejection. Dismissing or refusing to receive what we need to receive for good living. And the Bible tells us, uh, we're very familiar with this scripture in Isaiah 53 and three. He is despised and rejected of men. Talking about God. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Here's what he did. He gave his son. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him.
him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. And the word of God says, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. He did this stuff for us. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Yet, it talks about the fact that with all of that he did, he was despised and rejected of men. Now, I look back in my studies at 1 Samuel, the eighth chapter, and the seventh verse through the end of that chapter, talks about a season where Samuel had to go before the Lord and tell the Lord what was going on. He said, Lord, your people are having an issue. They're challenged, they're complaining. It talks about the fact that the people of God, who God had dealt with and been their leader and king and lover and deliverer and all that for so long, they decided, if you decide to read it, you get more of the details, but for time's sake, they decided, give us a team. Samuel was at a point in his life where he had chosen his sons to serve and, and do what his sons weren't doing like they felt they should. And they went back to Samuel and said, Samuel, give us a king. Samuel goes and takes it before the Lord and he tells him, he says, Lord, this is what they want, they want a king. And as you look down in that reading, when we get down, it says, let me read some of it to you. And the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people. Listen, listen to the people. And all that they say unto you, for they have not rejected you. See, a lot of times when we, the men and women of God, preach the word and folks don't receive it, we get all depressed and all upset because they didn't hear it. And it wasn't that they were rejecting what you, the person, they were rejecting the word of God. They refused to hear what God says to them. He says, don't, don't, don't get upset. But they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Don't want godly advice. Don't want God to tell you, I'll take care of you, and all you've got to do is follow my instructions to live victoriously and rejoice in the Lord. You don't want to do it that way? He says, that's what they're rejecting. They're not rejecting you. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. They, they, they're doing the same thing. It's not you. It's them rejecting God. They go after other things. Mm. Now, therefore, hearken unto their voice. Listen to them. Howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. Now, if they don't want to go under my instructions, I'm going to let them know up front, this is what you're going to go through if you take a king like you say you want. Mm. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, this is what he told them. This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take his sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before this chariot. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties and will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of, of his chariots. And he will take charge your daughters to be his confectionaries and to be good and to be cooks. Now, I didn't mean, say how good they were. And to be bakers. He was taking the folks, you want the king? You want him to be over you? You gonna work for it. You gonna slave for it. You gonna fight not for God, but for him. And he will take your fields. He's gonna take your stuff from you. And your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. It's all gonna be about the king. 
And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your donkeys, because I got children in here that don't understand when I read it that way, and put them to work for him. He will take the tenth of your sheep. He shall, ye shall be his servants. And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye shall have chosen. You choose this stuff. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused, they rejected. The people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, yeah, but we will have a king over us that we also may be like all the nations. I want to be like them. And that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. He ain't going to fight for you. You're going to fight for him. Y'all don't even see it. And Samuel heard all the words of the people and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. Now he went back and told God what God already knew. God heard it because God knew it before he even went back to him with it. All right? And the Lord said to Samuel, hearken unto their voice, give it to him, and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, go ye every man unto his city. Go ahead. Give you a king. Give you what you want. And when I looked at the scripture and the Lord began to speak to me, he said, this is what's happening today. This is why the church isn't where it should be victoriously because we've dissected, we've rejected parts of what God has said should be our standard of living. And in the church now, it seems to be compromised, but the compromise comes because folks want to be like them. Hello? Israel said, we want to be like the others. They got a king. And so now the people of God in the 21st century say, yes, we want to practice our faith. We want to come and look like the saints. But we want to be like, like them. where holiness is not the standard because we still got folks wanting to be like them. Living holy is, well, it don't take all of that anymore because we want to, hello, rejection. Listen to this little story. In 1830, there's a man named George Wilson. And he was sentenced in Philadelphia to be hanged for murder. And Andrew Jackson, the president at that time, pardoned him. But when the jailer presented the pardon to Mr. Wilson, Wilson refused it. I'm going to die. I'm supposed to die. The president pardons me, but I refuse to accept the pardon. Think about it. Is that not the way of the world today? Jesus loves you. He gave his life for you. To pardon you from death, that is your sentence for sin. And men do what? Reject it. No. So Mr. Wilson rejected the pardon. And the sheriff had to know whether Mr. Wilson should be hung or not. So they had to take the, cat, the matter back to the Supreme Court. Now here was what happened. It was stated in the Supreme Court that no such point of law had ever been raised before. You will have to listen to this very carefully. Chief Justice Marshall gave the following decision. He says, a pardon is a piece of paper, the value of which depends upon its acceptance by the person implicated. Y'all understand that? If you don't, raise your hand, I'll help you with it. Okay, Timothy. A pardon is a decision made and written on a piece of paper by someone which says that if you're guilty of something, if you've done something wrong, we're gonna forgive you of it. And you won't have to serve the sentence for what you did. You got that? 
And that's what they did for this man who had committed murder. They gave him a pardon. But somewhere in there, either he didn't forgive himself or he couldn't believe that it was really happening. So the decision was made that the person that is being implicated has to accept the part. It is hardly to be supposed that one under a sentence of death would refuse to accept the pardon. But if it is refused, it is no pardon. So George Wilson must be hanged, and that he was. He could not have been more than five, and he was a pathetic little figure, this next story says, as he carried a valise down the front steps of his home. Around the block, he trudged, and around again, he went, and he kept going around and around the block. But there was somebody standing and looking at him, a policeman. So finally, the policeman stopped him and said, what's the idea? And the little boy said, I'm running away. Explained him. He, he said, sadly. And the officer said, look, I've had my eyes on you, and you've been doing nothing but walking around the block. Do you call that running away? And the little boy said, well, what do you want me to do? I ain't allowed to cross the street alone. <laughs> and that's what happened when Adam fell. We became guilty of sin because of Adam's doing. Ever since that, man has, mankind has been just going round and round in circles. Rather than one accepting the pardon or acknowledging that they needed Jesus Christ as their savior. This is what we do when we come part the way and still want to live our own way because we reject the full salvation of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. But see what happens, we come a little bit to Christ. Okay, I'll come to church on Sunday. Okay, I, I, I'll read the scripture every now and then. So we never come to full turnaround. We never accept that full pardon for our sin and become the new creature. Because we still want to hold on to some of the old stuff. Rejection. That's the first thing in this thing that doesn't please God. Let's move on a little bit. Next one says, lack of faith. Everybody says, lack of faith. Lack of faith. We know we always faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We go into Hebrews and look at all of those monarchs and those people of God who ex exercised and showed faith. But the lack of faith is the inability to have trust or confidence in a person or in the spiritual world. You have a lack of faith, lack of trust, lack of confidence in God. These are things that displease God. We're talking about posture, our behavior, our attitude, the way we position ourselves as Christians. We saw all the good stuff, but now we got to see what displeases God. So we're talking about a lack of faith. And, and, and there's a scripture in the New Testament that talks about a time that Jesus is going to, to visit a house and heal somebody, raise them from their bed. There was a whole lot of folks in the house, but everybody in the house didn't believe. So he had to say, listen, I, I'd like for you to excuse yourself from this exercise right now because I've got something to take care of. And only until he removed those who had a lack of faith and confidence in his ability could he get the job done. He could I mean, I believe he could have done it with them there, but he wanted everything that was negative and not on the same link with him, out the way. And when I begin to look at that and study that, here's the thought that came to mind. I said, God, we, we talk about signs, wonders, and miracles in the house. We have testimonies on, 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 on individual basis of people being healed and people being delivered. Yes, it does happen. And then we get the question, Elder, sometimes that why don't we see miracles in the house? Because you got folks in the house that don't have confidence and faith in God. Now let me help you through that a little bit. We on a level say yes we do. 
But when we're challenged, get me here, understand me. When we, if we were to have somebody in here right now that was blind, and me or another vessel of God says, God is going to heal them and open their eyes right now. I can guarantee you that we would not have 100% confidence in the ability of God to do it. You may not open your mouth and say it, but you'd be sitting there saying, oh God, what's going to happen if he don't see right away when she prays for him? Y'all quiet in here. You want to know why God And that wasn't even still a whole hundred percent of the folks there because they still saying, well, eh. My God can and will perform miracles. <laughs> but I guess we have to use some of the common uh, uh, lingo, uh, take the limits off of God. Why did you have Everybody focus in this. Pray and believe. No, you should have came in here with that expectation. I, I got troubled in my spirit. I said, God, I want to see it happening again. But we got to get everybody to have me on one, one accord. Can't have no folks in the house saying, I'm here to see if it's going to happen. No, you better come. I'm coming. I'm here to see it happen. Yeah, but don't you have some sickness and aren't you going through some stuff? I don't know why I am where I am, but I know my God is able. And he's willing and he can and he will take the limits off of God. And we don't come just to be entertained by miracles and signs and wonders. But that should be a part of our worship and what goes on in the life of this ministry because we serve a God who is. Thank you. We serve a God. Let's try that again. We take the limits off of him because we serve a God that we know is. Oh, praise the Lord. What the end of that scripture in Matthew, the 13th chapter, verse 58 says, and he did not perform any miracles in that place because of their unbelief. What else displeases God? Pride. A feeling or deep pleasure or satisfaction that comes from one's own achievements. What I did. Child, I preached last Sunday. No, you didn't. Because there were some folks that went to sleep and missed your message. And they see, I see that old woman. So. It's derived from one's own achievements, the achievements of those with whom one is closely associated with, or from qualities or positions that are widely admired. I told you all. Of, of my experience on that string that was going on when the baby saw for the first time and somebody in that string of communication online said, thank God. And there were non-believers on the line who got very upset. Why are you thanking God? Thank the doctor. The doctor did it. The doctor went to school and studied. And he prepared himself, and the doctor did it, not God. I thank God for the doctor, but I thank God for the wisdom. What man in and of himself knows how to fry a chicken? <laughs> it, it, it's a funny point, but who told him to take it and put it over a fire in some oil? It's a God-given ability. It's nothing that we do. It, uh, 
in and of ourselves have a run the matters of our lives. Because see, there's other folks that don't have God and they get all mixed up and confused and frustrated and they take their lives because they can't handle things. But we got a God that if we will surrender our lives to him, he helps us go through the good stuff. He helps us go through the trials. He helps us go through the bad stuff. He helps us go through when there's sickness in our bodies and somebody wants to say, I give up because I'm sick. We got enough nerve to say, God, you made it. Take care. Proud. It'll tell somebody it'll mess you up. Mess you up. Yeah. 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 In, in James the fourth chapter, verse six, he says, "But he giveth more grace." Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! He giveth us. He gives us more grace, y'all. Excuse my tongue. Wherefore he said, "God resists he he wards off the proud, yeah. but giveth grace, giveth grace." To the humble. Being humble does not mean you are weak. See, that's what it, being humble, see, everybody wants to say, oh, Bishop is such a sweet man, and he's so nice and soft spoken and everything. Y'all just haven't been on the other side of that. He ain't weak at all. I know when to shut my mouth. I know when I said enough. I know when to say, check. Whatever you say, Bishop, yes, sir. And he don't have to raise his voice. He's a strong man. And he's never put his hands on me. Amen. This year, we will, this week, we will be celebrating 40. <laughs> he remembers, not me. 46 years of marriage. It seems, it seems just like yesterday, yeah. <laughs> Everybody understand, likewise, young folks, submit yourselves to your elders. Y'all think y'all know it all, mm -mm. We might not know it like you know it today, we might not say it like you say it, we might not rock like you rock, but we've experienced it. And our experience can help you get over some stuff. And parents, stop using this excuse that they'll learn for themselves. Let them do it. Let them say, uh uh. So you you want to see your child destroyed? Leave them out there to do it all for the next. Be, be a wise parent. Sow the seeds. Teach them. Tell them. That's love. There's not too much that Nana said to us when we were growing up that we don't appreciate today. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. All of you be subject one to another. Listen to somebody and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth the grace to the humble. Next point. Uh-oh. Stubbornness. I see a husband and wife moving closer together on that one. <laughs> Stubbornness. The definition that I ran across said, dogged determination. Dogged determination not to change one's attitude or position on something. Sometimes stubbornness comes because of who you surrounded yourself with and you think you can get away doing what they did. Let me give you a good example of that. Uh, I received a call this week. One of the grandparents was observing the grandchildren. And the older grandchild had been told to do something and the younger one, which was very young, just a year old, a little bit of gone too, was standing back watching. So 
when the older one was told to do and, and, and they didn't do, the other one was taking it in. So when the younger one was told, come on, let's get ready to go, let's put on the coat, she just decided, I'm gonna try that same thing. <laughs> can't talk, can't communicate, but the attitude, the behavior, I'm gonna take my stand, I'm gonna be stubborn, I'm not gonna listen. And God says that, okay, you wanna go about that way, you wanna be stubborn, you're going to pay for. Not necessarily because God's gonna do anything tremendously bad to you, but the fact that you just refused, you gonna make stuff happen to you that didn't have to happen all by itself. And then we want to turn around and say, if God is so good, why did he allow this to happen? He, you know what? Sometimes he just sit back and say, let me see what the, that person is going to do. Stubbornness, dog determination not to change what is attitude. This displeases God. This is what we're talking about. Displeasing God. And we are supposed to be the saints, but we're stubborn. Stubbornness. Stubbornness says that when you're being given right instructions for holy living and you have the ability to follow those instructions, your pride steps in and causes you, I want to move this thing all the way backwards right from here. Your pride steps in and causes you to reject and have a lack of faith in the ability of that operation or instruction that you're being given to follow. It, it, it's, a, it's a whole chain that connects there. That causes bad behavior that ends up displeasing God. And we're talking about posture and attitude that keeps us from being the victorious saints that we're supposed to be. We sometimes live in depressed states and in, 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 in positions of having an unhappy life is because we don't want to follow the prescribed methods that God says in his word. So we can't be stuck. Oh, the next one, y'all. Okay, let me just give you a scripture. Gotta give you a word. Romans, the second chapter. Verse 5 says, But after they thy hardness an impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. You put yourself in a position to be in judgment. And the word of God tells us that certain things are just all disobedience is what? And when you look at being stubborn, you're setting yourself up for sinning. When you're rebellious, you're taking the position of not believing what God says. There's a funny saying that I created as a result of one of my brothers from the past about getting tickets. When the sign says, do not park, Okay? And you park there, what's the end result? You're going to get a ticket. If you say, I, I'm going to park here anyway, it meant that you didn't believe that you were going to get a ticket. And then when you get a ticket, you get mad because you got the ticket and you try to explain it. But the fact of it is, you were given an instruction, you were told up front. You even had a manual that taught you before you got the license that if you do certain things, there will be certain consequences. But when it comes to God, we don't want to believe that God said all oh, disobedience is sin. And then what did he say? The wages of the payment for disobedience, the payment for sin is God couldn't be so loving that he would do that. Yeah. 
I mean, let's move on to the next one. Rebellion is an act of violent or open resistance to an established government or ruler. And you know what they do to rebels? What do they do to rebels? Who said that? Thank you, Timothy. They kill rebels while I was traveling. September. One of the, the tour guide told us that people from all different countries come to visit their country. He says, but we will not take anyone that is of, and I don't want to because I'm not looking to offend, from this particular nationality, we will not allow them to come into our country. If they are a practicing, if they practice the religion, but they're not that individual. Okay, let me do it this way. Uh, no, I can't do it that way. Um, I can be an African American or black, okay? But not be allowed to go into a certain place because I'm an Afri African American or black. But if I can extend it just as much to help you understand it, if I practice the black culture, and I'm not black, I can be accepted into the country. Y'all got that? I'm not black, but I like fried chicken. Yeah. Collard greens and potato salad, okay? I can go, oh, sure, come to my country and cook black, uh, you know, fried chicken, potato salad, collard greens, and all that stuff. Come on in. But if I'm black, I'm not allowed in. Y'all got that? Yeah, can you follow that? Because it's, it's, I don't want to go and use the, I don't want to offend, so I'm not going to call those particular. But in that country, they said, we're not going to accept you in because that particular group of people are enemies to that country. You understand what I'm saying? And so they say, if you're of that nationality, you can't come in here. Because we don't know what you'll do when you get here. Okay? And so we, the people of God, have to take such a standard for who we are. We can't compromise or allow rebels in the house. How have we allowed rebels in the house? When we have individuals that say, we want to be a part, but we don't want to do it like you do it. This is the teaching of this house, holiness. So if you come in, don't come in here and rebel and say you're going to live like you want to live and call yourself one of us. You got to live it so that we're sure that you're not a rebellion trying to destroy the house. Oh, that's heavy. Ah, no, I can't even take that. See, I can't take, can't take no credit for that. Rebellion. An act of violent or open resistance. I resist what you say should be the case. I'm coming in amongst you. It's what the enemy wants to do to us. He wants to infiltrate. He wants to get in there, but he don't want to do it like the, he don't want to hold up the standard. He don't want to be holy when he say be holy. He don't want to pray when he say pray. He don't want to fast when he say fast. He don't want you to learn the word of God. That's a rebellion. Because how can you live it if you don't know it? And sometimes when you're trying to know it, you don't get it all the first time, so you've got to keep rehearsing it in your spirit. If you want to be one of his, if you got to break down that spirit of rebellion, that wall that keeps you from growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, you got to keep going after it. you got to keep going after it. Brother Kenny, yes, I understand I was supposed to go after it, but I couldn't keep going after it because other things were distracting me, but I can't call myself a representative. Because I ain't got it yet. And there's too many in the body. See, that was a 
person when he got what I'm talking about. There's too many in your body that wants to call themselves a child of God, people of God, but you don't know nothing about it. You have no relationship with it. You haven't learned the word of God yet. You've been here five years now and still don't know John 3.16. Oops. Okay. How about the last? Hostility. If you're rebellious, then the next thing that displeases God is that you become hostile. You stand up and make a declaration that can destroy the house, can poof, blow up the house because you're being hostile. We're in a hostile. He's taking, you take our young people and hold them hostile in a situation that is not pleasing to God because you've rejected the word of God. You've been stubborn. You've been rebellious. You have a lack of faith. And all of it comes out in a hostility. Back to the snow, Thursday. This is not the first time it ever snowed. But I saw as I sat on one street for an hour and a half, not the same other one for three hours, but on a particular street, I saw there were two lanes going out to the main road, and I was in one of the two lanes, because I had to make a left turn. And the third lane was for the traffic coming into the street. Well, somebody became hostile and said, I'm not doing it like this. So he came out of the lane behind us and started driving in the lane of the oncoming traffic. And when he got to the corner, he couldn't go because the main street was so congested with traffic, but now he's blocking what should have come in the house. Uh oh. Did y'all get that when I said just that? Your hostile spirit puts you in a different lane. You're not flowing with the traffic, even though the Word of God teaches us how to be patient how to control our spirits and our attitudes and our behavior. Now you want to get out and do your own thing in the wrong lane. But not only are you about to cause danger to somebody that might come in the lane, but you're blocking folks that want to come in the house. Because your attitude and behavior is in opposition to what we, the saints of God, should be exhibiting in our behavior. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And the scripture teaches us that the sheep know their shepherd's voice. Now, closing with this little story that has been told time and time again, that a shepherd was taking food to a sheep that had a broken leg. And there was another shepherd who kept watching him do this over and over again. And he said, I've been watching you as you take food to that sheep over there. He said, how did he break his leg? The shepherd said, mm-mm, he didn't break his leg, I broke his leg. You broke his leg. Yes, I broke his leg. Because he had begun to wander off away from the flock, doing his own thing. And then, while he was wandering off, other sheep began to follow him. I was losing sheep in my pasture. Sheep were acting crazy and off. They weren't even fives. They were going through the he said, so I had to go get him and break his leg and put him down for a minute. And he had to learn that because he had a broken leg, he couldn't feed on his own. I had to go and tend to him. And I had to feed him every time he needed to eat. But I did it in love so that he understand I'm the one that cares for you. By the time he gets up on his feet again, he 
going to know who his shepherd is. God doesn't want us to suffer at the hand of, a, of, of having to have him break our legs just to get us in line. But when he's given us instructions in his word on how to live, our posture, our attitude. You see, he had to take that, that sheep down from being able to stand upright. He had to break it. No, that, no, that's not why you did that to me, did you? <laughs> Preaching to my own son. Yes, Lord. See, that's what it brings me to. It's yes, Lord. For those of you who don't know, I broke my femur last year. I fell off, uh, just flew up the stairs and broke my leg last year. Praise God, I'm walking real good, pretty good, pretty good. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But I'm going to tell you this, I still feel the result of that. Hello? It's something I won't forget for a long time. The doctor said, well, isn't it healed now? Yeah, but now you've put something in there to keep it in line. Who in here does God need to bring in line with what he has for your life? Who in here is not standing in full posture the way God wants us to stand? you got part one and two. So if you don't know how he wants you to stand, part one tells you all the things that are positive to standing with the right attitude as a saint of God, as a Christian, living the way God wants us to live. And then after he tells you how he wants you to live, he says, now, these are the things that you need to avoid. These are the things that you need to stay away from. Don't reject. Don't rebel. Don't be stubborn. Everybody stay. There are a few other terms and adjectives that are used to describe the things that displease God. Contempt. Sometimes we actually become disrespectful. We become indifferent. I can take it, I can leave it. Sometimes we become hardened of heart. Sometimes we outright rebel against God. That stubbornness, that distrust, that faithlessness, pride. Ain't nobody do this for me, I did it for myself. That's self-justification. And then there's just the fact that we don't believe God is who he is. We want so much for others to come be a part of ministry, for the ministry to grow. But you need to examine yourselves because what is it about the way we live one with another as Christians. But when certain things come up, the saints say, I don't feel like being bothered with them folks. Even in a hospital where everybody is sick, you'll find patients, because the nurses and the doctors might not be available, you sometimes find patients trying to help each other. But in church, y'all know what I mean? They down, let me help. In the church, we don't lift each other like we're supposed to. We wait with an open ear to find the bad thing going on so we can run with it. Not everybody, no, not everybody. Some of us have the hearts to pray one for another. But the church is not the place that it's supposed to be anymore. The church is the place where imperfect people come. And yes, we're in here, we're all imperfect people because we live in the flesh. And the flesh desires things that don't always please God. So we keep coming so that we can find out how to put it all together like he wants us to be. But in the meantime, 
I told y'all at the beginning, practice praise. Practice the word of God. I really pray that you enjoyed that word you just heard. It's important to us to communicate to you the gospel of Jesus Christ. He loves you so much. He paid the dear price that each of our sins could be forgiven. He gave Jesus Christ his son, who shed his blood, died, was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the scripture. And if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ's death can take away your sins, which he says, and you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ can come into your heart. You simply need to bow and pray. Ask God's forgiveness. Ask him to come into your life to forgive your sin and he'll walk with you every day of your life. Proverbs teaches us out of that third chapter, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. He'll direct your path. Let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these that are spending a few moments with us. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you'll hear their prayer. And as they pray to you with faith in you, the God that can do everything, I pray that you'll give physical healing to those that are suffering, just as you've healed my body in the past. That you'll bring peace to troubled minds, lift burdens from heavy hearts as they trust you with situations that they can't resolve on their own. Comfort us. Make your presence known to us. Father, we love you and we thank you for all that you do for us. We pray that as we draw near to you, you'll draw near to us. In Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. Amen. Remember, God loves you and we love you too. Until next time.